dear friends, in case some of you didn't hear, if you left some items for blessing yesterday, His Holiness blessed everything yesterday after the session or during meditation. So you may uh, pick uh, your items up uh, from the blessing table. Um, another information, if you would like to buy uh, the text that uh, Lama Jampataye is uh, commenting, you may do so in our Dharma shop. So uh, this booklet is available there. And uh, same regarding the Bodhicharya Avatara, the Shantideva text that His Holiness is commenting. Both of these books you may buy in our Dharma shop. So please buzz, pass this information to your friends uh, in case they are not here. Uh, for now, this is everything. Thank you.
um, we will need some helpers to fold the kataks in the evening in the gompa at 8 p.m. today because we will need some helpers to put them nicely before the empowerment. And so uh, if you would like to volunteer, you may come here at 8 p.m. to the gompa and uh, probably on the right side of the gompa you will be able to join the group and uh, help folding it. After the lecture, I will again ask some volunteers and hopefully you will see some hands. Um, another announcement about the opening hours of the gompa. Please be aware that we have to close the gompa at 10 p.m. Uh, it's a shrine which is filled with many precious objects. Um, and I know some of you would like to meditate. This is wonderful. But please keep in mind we have to close the gompa. And there are some monks who are taking care of this gompa. They are, uh, they are opening the gompa early in the morning. And so they need to sleep as well. So the gompa will be closed at 10 p.m. in the evening. So please kindly cooperate and keep this in mind. If you would like to meditate, you're free to join the meditation at 6 a.m. Grandpa will be open and waiting for you. Thank you.
So where were we yesterday? Um, joyful effort or diligence, that's where we were yesterday. <coughs> so I hope and that uh, you had some time to um, view or reflect uh, or in plain words, just watch, you know. Uh, in this case, um, with the help of the uh, the literature, Bodhicaya um, Avatara in Sanskrit and in English, the Bodhisattva Way by Master Shanti Deva. Uh, watch, view, and reflect um, on the verses, previous verses, uh, verses uh, that we are focused on, I mean trying to focus on, and um, then of course 
more importantly on the last um, 25 hours of um, of um, things that uh, took place you know <coughs> and so um, yes it's the the most sort of effortless aspect uh, of this practice um, or the entire practice of a Bodhisattva requires for us is uh, just to observe, just to watch, just to view. And uh, from there, then, uh, without having to be changed, altered, forced, pushed, something happens. And that's the beauty of it, I think. Yeah. Because otherwise, um, uh, because of uh, our um, upbringing or um, the way we are grown up, we um, we are either tired of that uh, upbringing, or due to that upbringing, then um, we want uh, a change, and and so on, you know, and so. And then to kind of adequately cater that or cater those emotions, then there are various philosophies, various religions, you know, Buddhism included in this case, whether it's a religion or not. Mm, and um, and therapies, um, all sorts of things, you know. Uh, living style or lifestyle, all sorts of things, to kind of accommodate those emotions. One, because we are so used to a certain way of thinking, certain way of living, and on the other hand, because we are tired of them, and things like that. And so, mm, <coughs> uh, if we observe carefully, about Buddha Dharma in general, and in this case, uh, that of uh, the practice of the um, Bodhisattvas, or the way of the Bodhisattvas, is that <coughs> um, the um, uh, relaxed sort of observation, but continuous observation, seems to be uh, the key. Um, because um, the introduction of how we are, you know, like you now in this room or hall, for many of us, either we are born, so-called born as Buddhist, or um, introduced into Buddhism, whichever way. Um, and once again we really don't quite know how to go about it, actually. In that sense, we're kind of a beginner. You know. No matter how, uh, how many days it has been, or how many years it has been, pretty much the same thing. And so therefore, we want to mm, obviously do the right thing. <laughs> um, but what is the right thing, you know? It's, it's very difficult to say. So observation, or viewing, or watching, that uh, seems to be the most um, uh, uh, not to say appropriate, but uh, the most gentle way. You know, um, <coughs> um, if it happens without noticing, it's the best, you know? In a very passive way, it happens, you know, and often that's how things happen in life. Whether there are good encounters or bad encounters or good experiences or bad experiences, often they happen in that manner. Yes, there are moments where things happen in a very sort of sudden way, um, but 
no matter how impressive they are, um, um, how to say, we are often uh, left what to do with that experience sort of thing. So, therefore, yes, that observation. <coughs> That's why the, um, the very first, well, nobody really knows exactly what Buddha said the, the first time after he was uh, uh, after his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. But it is safe to say that according to, uh, mo to, to most, and that um, uh, he said, the first thing he said was uh, basically um, that it is Im uh, very noble or it is very uh, interesting, it is very beneficial uh, to know, to understand, uh, to watch, to view um, the nature of dukkha. Um, or the nature of uh, life, or nature of samsara. <clears throat> and so, there it is, you know. And so, um, um, there is no uh, forcing there. Um, as long as we have the human condition, we are endowed with all these qualities to observe, to, to watch. And by using it to observe and watch, then we know exactly, it's just a matter of time, we will know exactly what is what, without um, forcing anything. Then yes, now then, um, there are spiritual sort of, there are favorable conditions, spiritual conditions, such as the teacher and so on, wonderful stuff. Mm. But then we have to know mm, how to utilize that, how to make the most of that. Um, maybe for some time I may have been uh, sounding as if uh, to say, oh, the teacher is not so important and so on, and therefore feeling a little bit confused, you know, here and there. Uh, but then what I'm trying to say is that, no, no, we have to make the most of it. We have to make the most of the spiritual friend. Uh, but um, not in a way that to somehow leave everything in, uh, in the spiritual friend's hand to take care of everything. That's also not possible. It's also not possible to, to do everything by ourselves also, you know. There is that interdependency where we do uh, what we can and we also allow the spiritual friend to do what they can also. And then through that, then we reach a, somehow a very healthy relationship and um, then we progress. So, uh, in that sense, then I hope you were able to have some time for yourselves to uh, view how it has been. Weather-wise, um, atmosphere-wise, uh, quite pleasant. Holy Kaziruko. Holy yeah. Wait for the holy. Um, it's one of the most magical things. It's very colorful. And the moment the holy begins, the weather suddenly changes. Yeah. So enjoy and savor <laughs> this coolness. It's going to happen soon very soon. 
You don't know what holy is? Huh? You know. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, sorry? What? You don't want, well, not everyone knows, of course, yes. It's very colorful. <laughs> Um, so, um, because of it, uh, because of the pleasant uh, atmosphere, um, I don't hear many coughs, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so therefore, you would have quite a bit of ample time to reflect. And um, yeah, it's in those little moments, you know, where you have uh, some sort of a, you know space or leisure time to to reflect. That's when you um, understand the most or begin to realize many things about yourself, about others, about uh, all this um, strangeness. So <clears throat> then, if we are able to somehow understand something, view something, absorb something, uh, or realize something about the first noble truth, uh, then the joyful effort becomes truly a joyful effort. This particular chapter be truly becomes a joyful one. Otherwise, um, it's, it becomes more of a, um, either a duty, because someone said so, and um, mm, we have to do it because of our, I don't know, race or creed or uh, um, uh, pride or well, many, many things, you know. And on the other hand, it's, as I said earlier, because uh, we want a change, you know, we want to do something different. Um, and so therefore, uh, it won't really last that very long. If we begin that way, all the way, then you, uh, yesterday's question, we might reach a certain plateau. And so therefore, yeah, that observation is very, uh, is the key. That first noble truth is the key. By doing it, by doing so, then um, everything becomes more vivid, more clear, and as a result, um, um, it's like saying, um, if, if, if one is so used to a very bad diet, um, really don't know, you know, uh, what is what. But if you're, if you're able to somehow have the time to observe what is, what is that doing, then suddenly, um, without anyone forcing it, you yourself know what you want. And then through that process, then hopefully begin to enjoy um, a healthy lifestyle, you know. So it's something like that. And suddenly it doesn't feel like it's a regime. Suddenly, feel, uh, suddenly one feels that this is not a, you know, diet, that this is not a therapy. In fact, now uh, I can enjoy more sort of thing. <coughs> Uh, because there is now less salt, less sugar, uh, then you can actually begin to uh, taste the vegetables. You know, you can, you can taste um, uh, well, basically whatever you bite on. Whereas uh, all this while, then the overload of sugar and salt um, made you feel that um, vanilla ice cream. You know, uh, whereas uh, when you really discover 
vanilla ice cream, vanilla, vanilla, actually it's not sweet at all. Uh, it's just the added sugar that made you feel like vanilla is sweet, whereas the actual vanilla is more like very uh, unique form of, I don't know, coffee or something. Yeah. So then you begin to develop a kind of appreciation and respect for those flavors. And suddenly coffee itself, you know, is not necessarily sweet and creamy, but it has its own bitterness, it has its own aroma, uh, and so on. So in the same way, uh, we're not really, uh, you know, sacrificing <laughs> the, mm, the enjoyment, actually. Mm, sacrificing the food, or in this case, sacrificing the pleasure or something like that about life. It's just that uh, when you discover what is what, on its own sort of thing, without any added uh, layers. Yes, it, it initially it may be a little bit difficult to digest. Excuse me. Without those uh, layers, then you can relate uh, better, you know. So in the, it's the same thing. We're not saying, I mean, uh, Shantideva is not saying to suddenly live a very pious and religious life. Not in any way, no. All he's saying is just observe. And by doing, by doing so, uh, then uh, everything becomes clear. And uh, uh, everything becomes... Um, by having things more clear, then it's, there is that possibility that you can enjoy, actually, way more, you know, discover more things. And so... Um, yes, joyful effort, joyful effort. Of course, now in the next verse it says, uh, what is joyful effort? And that is the um, mm, having that enthusiasm, having that kind of um, looking forwardness, you know, towards virtue. So that's Mm, how the next verse begins. What did they say? Diligence means joy in virtuous ways. So, um, so yes, I've I've been for some time trying to put it in a very general way, but in this case, um, it's more precise, meaning that it's not just about, uh, you know the enthusiasm in doing something or anything that we like because of course I tried to be careful about it in the past by saying something, doing something that we like uh, except um, let's say uh, harming some, um, oneself or others you know but that's quite vague whereas here it's very precise by Shantideva by saying that if there is enthusiasm into doing something virtuous, then that is it. And so, um, uh, virtuous uh, action, speech, um, viewing or thought or thinking um, doesn't come by, of course, um, that randomly. Um, um, and so therefore, once again, observation or that viewing is the key. And by doing so, then you begin to discover that um, bitterness has its own place. 
is no, not all about sugar. Because otherwise, um, uh, for some time, uh, sugar and salt has dominated everything. And um, whereas um, in many cultures, I think, or previously, I'm sure, in every culture, uh, basically agrees that um, that there are five types of uh, sort of flavors: yeah? Sh uh, sweetness, uh, savoriness, bitterness, sourness. Uh, what else is there? Spice, yes. All of those, you know. So, yes, um, it's um, whereas most uh, for the for the most recent times, it's mostly just plain uh, uh, savory aspect and the sweet um, sweetening aspect. <coughs> it's good, but um, it just um, after some time it just become we we just becomes uh, we just become saturated by it because um, uh, just that taste uh, faculty aspect there are so, so many varieties and so therefore we ignore that you know ignorance yeah and so therefore. Suddenly, if you taste something bitter or sour, you feel that um, immediately the manager, you know, um, <coughs> sorry. Whereas, um, um, if uh, if you are used to sort of I don't know uh, being in more on the countryside or something like that, we know how each fruit tastes like and we can appreciate them you know and not just sort of um, uh, take the um, uh, how to say uh, the idea of how a fruit should taste like from Baskin and Robbins Um, well, I mean, I have nothing against Baskin and Robbins. I am a big fan. Yeah. <coughs> but the thing is, uh, it completely um, sort of um, 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 distorted my uh, perception of how vanilla should taste like, actually. It was way, way later that I discovered that oh, vanilla is very different. It's not sweet at all. It's not creamy at all. <coughs> it looks a lot like coffee. It tastes like coffee. So, like that, mm, we uh, can then <coughs> virtue, virtue. You know, it sounds so. I mean, whether it's in English or whether it's uh, in Tibetan or any language, virtue, virtue, goodness or good deed or good conduct, whatever it's called, um, and it begins to feel quite um, um, out of reach and difficult, uh, pricey, um, and so on. And as a result, then we feel that, um, mm, I mean, it'll come here. Uh, just the word itself, virtue, you know, itself, might um, how to say, uh, induce um, laziness, you know. It's possible, yeah. The very thing that we try to um, uh, introduced to ourselves uh, um, suddenly becomes um, the very sort of um, 
obstacle. So yes, virtue, virtue, um, <coughs> or in Tibetan it's known as gewa, you know, uh, uh, meaning, um, well, and strangely, um, sort of relates to a um, pleasant uh, pleasantness, you know, towards um, joy or something. Yawa. Uh, sort of because the virtue basically uh, produces something that is more pleasant. Uh, but in this case, pleasant maybe is not the right word because then it leans more towards pleasure and more towards sort of, you know, raw sensation and so on. Um, mm, but gewa uh, gewa or virtue as in what we say, uh, uh, do something productive, you know, do something meaningful. Um, don't just lie around. So it's kind of there, very, but very vague, you know. It has, it is kind of related to being productive in some ways, but not in a way that, uh, as if we have a factory going on. Uh, but in a sense um, that you are m m more in tune with what is happening, you know. Basically, uh, in tune with change, in tune with passing, in tune with, if I dare say, death in a way. Yeah. Because every moment is dying, you know, or changing. Maybe now it's a little bit more smoother by saying that. And so sort of upkeeping with that and not disregarding that, not putting that aside because uh, that's why yesterday I was saying something about nouns and verbs that uh, it's very uh, practical to have nouns, you know, but at the same time uh, when we use too many nouns, um, then there is that possibility that as if uh, we feel that as if um, there are uh, there are things that are permanent, you know there are things that you know existing uh, and so therefore, as long as we put together conditions then something appears, something manifests, and something stays. Just like a noun, you know. And then uh, we develop various uh, uh, abstracts. That maybe my health could be the same. Maybe my uh, youth can be the same. Maybe my happiness can be the same, you know. As long as we find enough uh, conditions we can make, we can find that noun or we can find that living thing, that permanent thing. So, um, yes, uh, in that sense, um, um, it's not a bad thing, of course. As I, like I said, it's very, very practical. But uh, it could lead, uh, uh, not exactly mislead, but possibly, to, uh, it could lead us uh, into thinking that, uh, that they are actual permanent things. Now, can you help me, how did I reach the point of the, this uh, subject of now? Sorry? Gewa, thank you so much. I didn't want to say I lost the train of my thought. <laughs> so, uh, great observation. So, Gewa, uh, or this, that productivity aspect, um, is, um, is something um, 
there is the, that productivity aspect is there. Yeah. Virtue, virtue, upkeeping with the momentum, upkeeping with the change, upkeeping with what we say maybe energy. I don't know. Uh, that vibrancy, you know, and uh, that is Gewa. Because then suddenly we feel that I did something today, I feel good about it, I'm going somewhere, and so on, yes? Those feelings are there. Yeah. So virtue, virtue is somewhere there, you know? Whereas if my, our mind is no, 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 and less verb, then we begin to feel saturated. But when, so, so you see, we are not trying to erase nouns at all, of course. Uh, but um, we're trying to find a balance, you know, that the verbs are there in an in interdependent way to say something. Because uh, we cannot just have pure verbs, of course. It's, it would be very difficult. <coughs> and so, yeah. Um, it's more like saying, um, naming and um, um, conceptualizing things in a way that is very uh, organic and living. That's, that's much closer. So gewa, virtue, is somewhere there, you know. It's the, um, not to say action, but acting or something. Or, the, um, or that, uh, you know, uh, what did I say yesterday? Doing, you know. And um, doing is sort of a little bit more intimate. Happening is a little bit further away. And, but, um, but it's a verb, and so therefore it's, it's more, um, more alive. And so, um, now in this case, the, yes, in contrast to sweetness, there is that bitterness, there is that sour, sourness. But we don't realize uh, those things because by now we are so used to just one or two flavors for, for so long. And we deem that that is it. And uh, uh, um, if it doesn't, then remove the rate, remove the star, the Michelin star. Um, but um, uh, um, actually how, how, how those ratings uh, gain is actually um, because there is a very sophisticated level of all those um, a good balance of flavors, you know. So, in other words, variety, well, what do they say? Variety is the, is the spice of life or something. It's somewhere there. So therefore, we really cannot say uh, we, we have to include this or we have to exclude this. It's it doesn't really work. Yes, just temporarily, you know, we can say this works and that doesn't work for practical reasons. But beyond that, uh, we cannot really say <coughs> this is it. No, it's very difficult. So virtue, virtue, gewa, it's, um, <coughs> it's a very, it can become a very political <laughs> thing. So, um, <coughs> um, um, through observation, then of, of that of the first noble truth, then um, one will discover that um, that uh, there, you know, joy uh, can be found, or the other way around. Um, and that through 
I mean, when we say open-minded, probably it might, in a way, it might sound quite forceful also, in some ways. But just observation, you know, just viewing, just watching, like nature watching or bird watching, making sure that the the birds are not disturbed, because otherwise they will fly away, you know. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will be like. Um, one of our friends used to say, um, had been in the jungle, a photographer in the, in the jungle, told to, said that we will pay you if you catch, you know, various aspects of this particular bird. And so I was living in the jungle for six months or so, I think. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but for a long time. And had waited and waited and waited to capture that bird and just couldn't find and so I think on few occasions he found that bird and then as if he was starving, you know, he chased after that bird and took lots of pictures. All he found was the bird at the back of the bird. <laughs> pictures of the back of the bird running away or, or flying away all the time. Uh, so it's something like that. So you really have to be you know, quiet, uh, passive, and don't alarm, you know, and that's how our mind is, or that's how life is, you know. If you see that there is a camera somewhere, then you will naturally feel a little bit shy or awkward, you know. So make sure that <laughs> you peep. <laughs> um, well, okay, I'll. I'll Stop there. <laughs> but basically, yes, uh, being silent and skillful really helps. And by doing so, um, then um, um, then it's it's only a matter of time. I mean, the other way of saying is in time, you know. So the other way of putting it is at least it's, it's only a matter of time that you will find joy uh, in, uh, in all aspects of life. <coughs> it can be a very bad experience, uh, but with enough observation, then one can see the humorous aspect of it, how stupid it is how idiotic it is, or something like that, about oneself, or about others, or things like that. And then, um, mm, you know, um, one by one, uh, it becomes more clear. So that's, um, that's the thing, I think. And so then, in the next verse, it says, uh, it's Contraries have been defined as laziness, and so uh, just as um, the f first three ch uh, or the previous three chapters has been about um, generosity, uh, uh, ethical conduct, um, what was it? Uh, your patience, and uh, each of their um, uh, counterpart, let's say. I mean, we can we can view it in a way by saying uh, stinginess, chapter of uh, of uh, of stinginess, uh, chapter of um, um, I don't know uh, wildness or, <laughs> uh, or being wild or something, um, and then the chapter of uh, the patience. So therefore. Um, anger, that's it, anger, yes. So in here, then, it's in, in another way, it's, it's, it's about laziness. Yeah. And then, of course, Shantideva is so um, uh, skillful, so therefore, he puts it in this manner, uh, where he it says it's about diligence, you know but actually is cont continuously talking about laziness. And so, 
Um, uh, therefore, now uh, it is important to discover uh, what are the counterparts um, or the opposites. So in this case, um, in general, one can just simply say laziness. Um, and then uh, within that, then, I mean, uh, of course, the words are there. It says, an inclination for unwholesomeness, defeat, uh, defeatism, and self-contempt. So that's one way of putting it. There was another version, I feel. Um, yeah. It says, diligence is a zest for virtue. Uh, what's contrary to that? To explain, it's laziness, clinging to the bad, and sloth, and self-disparagement. Is it disparagement, I think? If I said that in the right way. So, uh, um, uh, both in, in um, you know, one could say mundane life or in everyday life, or ordinary life, and at the same time, uh, if one is pursuing uh, a spiritual life, or in this case, uh, a life that is uh, in accordance with the Bodhisattvas, then the laziness is one of the main things that we have to tackle. That we have to, well, I suppose, as a first step, to observe. You know? Not only really to say, cut it right there. Nip it right there, you know. It's impossible. Laziness has been uh, a part of our life for the longest, for, for as long as we can remember, you know. It is, has, has become a very, very old friend, a very dear old friend. <laughs> and so therefore, we cannot just say bye-bye, you know, and out you go. Uh, it's it's um, not that simple. It won't happen. And so, therefore, the first thing is you have to listen to the um, to Shanti Deva's rumor <laughs> that there is something fishy, uh, fi something fishy about your old friend, you know. <laughs> and so, therefore, then you begin to observe, you know. <laughs> And um, then from that other observation, then we begin to discover many annoying traits, um, mm, bad habits. Uh, um, I mean, to begin with, from our, uh, in a, in a, from the perspective of everyday life, then how uh, how it. Uh, waste time, how it um, disrupts our productivity, you know, worldly virtues, you know, uh, all sorts of things. Yeah. And so therefore, um, yeah, that's, I think that that's how, it, that's pretty much how it begins. Yeah. <coughs> and so, uh, uh, what is the next verse? Yes, it says, a taste for idle pleasure and craving for repose and sleep. No qualms about the sorrows of samsara. And laziness indeed is born from these. Yes. Zun gang gela chua wo te yi minti chua shi cha le lo ngel na shen ba dang jilu dan yi nye pa wo. 
Nomle de Veronanta, Nira Tembe Sepai, Kobe Dunga Mijoli, Lelo Neva Chevajo. So there we have it. Um, uh, uh, mm, taste for idle pleasure. Mm. My personal best experience of that <laughs> was um, when I was supposed to do my homework, um, um, instead uh, I chose to uh, uh, trick um, my caretaker by saying, uh, oh, I'm using my computer uh, to, because at that time I remember um, um, the, uh, um, Tibetan fonts uh, came into being, uh, and they were the very first few versions, and, um, <coughs> and then one could use them and then there were particular formats that one could use so that then actually one could now digitally uh, type in uh, the various texts. So, <coughs> um, instead of doing the actual homework that I was supposed to do, instead I said, uh, well, to, to my caretakers that um, uh, I'm doing this very, um, uh, precious, um, what you call it, um, archiving uh, work of these particular texts, you know. And so, of course, I could see the... Um, <laughs> not so convinced look on their, on their faces, but I kind of got away. In that moment, I thought I got away. Yeah. Now, when I look back, actually, I... If I had focus on my uh, homework, I would be able to convey this commentary way better. So, there you have it. So, yeah. Mm, uh, yeah, idle, what is it? Idle pleasure, yeah. It's, it's a very strange thing. Uh, well, maybe it's a nature of laziness, I suppose. But the moment we are supposed to do something, or asked to do something, or told to do something, or even want to do something, not even halfway through, through the first few quarters, mm, uh, you suddenly feel, I have time, you know. I can do that later. Uh, Mm, uh, I can do something else, you know. That's as 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 cl um, close as I can explain. Yeah. It's very innocent, very innocent, very. Um, it's it's not alarming at all, you know. It just begins that way. And um, mm, uh, once, twice, of course, no harm. You know, but then one does it a few times, a few more times, and a little bit more, a little bit more, and suddenly, before you know it, you have created a channel. You know, and so the mind is like a river. The mind is like water, I suppose. And so, therefore, if you create that channel, then it it flows through that. You know, so whatever habit that you form, whatever sort of um, channel that you form, uh, then it, it flows through that more than anything else, you know. And before you know it, it has actually become a great obstacle. Not in, not in a very alarming way at all, you know, but in a very, very passive way. You feel like, I mean, I felt afterwards that I did something productive. <laughs> um, 
that I did not play games on the computer, you know, feeling extremely proud, you know, <laughs> that I did not play video games on the computer. I actually typed uh, many uh, good words, you know. I have learned from that also, about spelling and so on. But, um, uh, uh, of course, the, the end product is uh, that um, you don't know how how you missed the opportunity, actually. Yeah. And you are left dumbfounded in terms of why I don't understand this chapter, sort of thing, you know? <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, it's like that, yeah. About mm, almost every aspect, you know, in a worldly aspect, and of course, yeah, in a spiritual aspect, of course. And so, um, it's those little details, I think, that we have to once again observe or apply joyful effort, you know. Um, so, um, I have nothing against multitasking, you know. Uh, um, for I'm I think <laughs> maybe it suggests something of a multitasking. Um, but um, mm, uh, the mm, I think the point here of this particular diligence or this particular effort is to say uh, to. Uh, finish what you have started, in short. You begin something and you finish it, you know. It can be good, it can be bad, doesn't matter. It's like, let's say, you are learning how to play piano and it's horrible, you know. The way you play it to yourself, to others, it's horrendous. <laughs> but you finish it, you know. Um, so, same thing. Mm, in this case, uh, now, for example, it could be about your meditation. It could be about your daily session of Dorji um, Sempa, for example. It must be. It could be most of the time horrendous. You know, um, you are focusing on the Dorji Sempa syllable suddenly something else uh, happens and the syllable is somewhere there all the way into the kitchen and then you're focusing on the hand of the Doji Sempa that's all the way into the bathroom, you know? And <laughs> if you have actually, you know, if you could print out what you have visualized, <laughs> it's a Picasso, you know? <laughs> doesn't matter, no problem, but you finish it, you know, and um, don't uh, feel uh, that somehow, oh yes, I finished my, uh, this, uh, this particular day session, whereas it's possible that halfway through something happened and then uh, well, I mean, if it's urgent, really, really urgent is something, but otherwise, something, you know. Uh, and therefore, actually, you didn't even finish the session, yeah, and you had to leave. Things like that. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, in Tibetan, it says, nyomle, nyomle, but in the course, uh, we can apply this uh, to everything, but anything, like basically it's a kind of excuse. It's a kind of excuse to deviate from what you're actually doing. I mean, this happens all the time, you know. You have a folk, you have a plan this uh, to do, and then halfway through or just five minutes after, then you deviate from there with a you know, clever excuse or maybe a meaningful excuse and then deviate from there. And so therefore, what happens? As I was saying yesterday, 
process. Process hasn't taken place. There's an interruption of that process. So then, maybe you might get back to the end, you know, but there is no complete process because there's a huge gap. And so therefore, you're left uh, with, uh, uh, I like this vanilla ice cream, but I just don't know how it came into being, you know. <laughs> uh, whereas, if you go through the whole process, then yeah, there is a whole complete experience. You know? <coughs> so, yeah. So therefore, one could um, become dis completely distracted by that pleasure. Because there is a sense of pleasure, isn't it? Um, sometimes I feel that we, want, we promise ourselves or tell ourselves that I want to do something. Because at the back of one's mind, one knows that there is a sense of a pleasure by beginning something and then <laughs> and then scooting away to do something else, because there's that excitement, you know. It's possible, maybe not. Um, so yes, so being lost in that sensation of pleasure, and then a craving for repose, repose and sleep. Yes, sleep. Um, well, um, well, I think here, I think it's possible. Uh, not right now, but after holy, it's possible. Um, the afternoon nap, or somewhere in Spain, probably it's possible too. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I read something about uh, the Google companies um, where they have those places where the, the staffs can take a nap, but actually uh, at the end they abandoned that or something because it uh, interrupted the creativity. Initially they thought it was helping the creati uh, creativity but later on, they <laughs> realized that everybody was sleeping. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> of course, um, it's not saying you should not sleep, or you should be like a guard, um, or you should be like a machine, you know. But basically it's saying, um, Oversleep, I think. Oversleep. Uh, oversleep happens, I suppose, um, mainly because of, I mean, it's uh, something that is uh, occurring to all of us, of course, because of um, the uh, requirement of having to be productive, you know. Um, and so, therefore, one goes on to be productive till very late. And then, of course, wake up late or something, I suppose. And so therefore, of course, it's not really a case where you feel that uh, I'm craving, I think. Uh, it's just that um, because of our habit, you know, that pattern of our sleep uh, is such that uh, obviously if you sleep late, we will wake up late, you know. And... Um, uh, whereas, if one is really sleeping, you know, in the m in the middle of our sleep, we really don't know whether we are enjoying or not enjoying at all. We are as good as dead. <laughs> it's completely off, you know, <laughs> completely switched off, uh, and uh, there is no. Um, there's nothing elegant about it. Uh, I mean, especially the way I snore. <laughs> There's nothing elegant about it. I have recorded many times of myself sleeping. And it's horrendous. 
Um, but um, the, the idea of pleasure about sleeping is often before sleeping and when we are being kind of woken up and we just think just five more minutes, yes. or please, uh, at least one more minute, you know. And that snooze button is our favorite button. And so, yes, uh, in this case, um, I mean, um, Shantideva has covered, of course, by, um, by indicating that, first of all, in a uh, mundane life, um, it interrupts so many things, all kinds of productivities, you know. And particularly if one has um, that uh, slight awakening about pursuing a bodhisattva's life, then sleep is one. Yeah. It's not to say sleep less, you know, sleep three hours a day or four hours a day, just so that one could feel that um, I'm a hardcore practitioner or uh, I don't eat, I don't sleep, I just drink coffee and <laughs> I'm very productive, you know. <laughs> And um, mm, and uh, and feel cool, you know. <laughs> um, no, um, it's uh, it's it's understood. I think, uh, according to um, to his to 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 Buddha Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, during his time, I think, uh, um, it was pretty simple. I think everybody went to bed. I mean. His um, uh, the fellow uh, practitioners that was uh, um, around him, they pretty much slept soon after sunset, I think. Yeah. So eight, nine p.m. they begin to sleep, uh, and then they woke up around maybe three a.m. or something like that, and that was it, you know. And so if you think, calculate that way now, how many hours is that? seven, maybe eight, you know, so yeah, good sleep, good sleep, healthy sleep, you know, so there's no lack of sleep there at all, uh, uh, got everything that the body needed mm, for the organs to rest, and at the same time, mm, that morning uh, air is such, I mean, particularly uh, here in India, around that time is the coolest, where you can think, where you can, um, I mean, if you want to plan, you can plan things better, you know. So yes, he didn't say don't sleep, you know, um, and don't eat also, uh, but um, instead uh, to not to misuse uh, sleep, I think. That's pretty much it, because otherwise, then naps, siestas, uh, these things uh, are contagious, <coughs> and before we know it, we just feel like I, I'm sorry, I have to, you know, and then that's it. <coughs> so. Um, Yes, it's a, it becomes a part of uh, excuse, I suppose, yeah. But, of course, these two are quite obvious, uh, quite, um, I, I suppose, manageable. Um, whereas the next one, uh, yes, the next one, it uh, says, the defeated, I don't know, no qualms about the sorrows of samsara. No qualms. Um, okay, it says, um, from craving sleep and savoring the pleasures of being indolent. Oh, sorry, not um, worrying about 
wearying, I suppose, wearying of samsaric pain. Yeah. So in this case, um, no observation, in short. You know, not, no observation of life. Uh, samsaric pain, maybe a little bit, um, I don't know, bitter maybe. No qualms about the sorrows of samsara, more poetic. Uh, but basically no observation, you know, uh, or not paying attention to, as I said, process of, of life, you know, that organic aspect of life. Uh, without it, then um, the the actual diligence, the actual effort, the actual tenru, which is a Tibetan word for diligence or effort, uh, the real one is not there. The first two are very supportive, you know, if you can conquer the two. Um, mm, idle pleasure, uh, for for idle um, yeah idle pleasure and um, sleep you know those those, those two I'm sure um, one can conquer you know if one is maybe uh, stricken by illness or by um, problems obstacles we can um, how do you say we can overcome them but. The uniqueness of this particular chapter is the third one, uh, that of um, not um, paying heed or attention or observation to uh, how life is um, changing, you know, how life is um, become or happening or where is it going sort of thing. But uh, in short, to um, be very honest, I think, that's the most important thing. Meaning, yes, of course, um, we have dear friends, dear family, uh, um, very um, close contacts, peers, companions, all sorts of things, you know, that really matters to our, to our, um, to where we have come, you know, uh, where we have come. Um, because of them, um, we have, um, you, know, if it, you know, in terms of our health, in terms of our wealth, in terms of our mental state, everything um, due to them that this is possible for example for us to meet it will not be possible without their support yes they are very very dear But no matter how dear they are to us, if you are honest, uh, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. At the same time, because of those dear, dear friends, we have all, this, all these problems. <laughs> because enemies, strangers, we have no real dealings with them at all. They, are, they hardly know us. <clears throat> In an indirect way, maybe they have some, you know, some influence. But it's our dear friends. So, yeah. 
observation of samsara, observation of life, observation of that process, means something very wholesome. We are, we, um, if we are able to be grateful of them, that covers a lot of that wholesomeness. Let's say 50% is, or more than 50% is covered. Or we can say 99% is covered. But that there's that 1% that we haven't covered. Which often it is the case uh, where we replace that grateful aspect of 99% with um, um, with uh, the opposite of gratefulness, uh, and then that just one or two percent of gratefulness. Either way, we can mix it up. You know, doesn't matter. The thing is, <coughs> you feel kind of torn between the two. You know, we can see the the grateful aspect, and at the same time, we can see also the destructive aspect of it. And so therefore, we don't quite know what to do with it, you know. Do we quit it, like as if maybe one quits an addiction? But is that humane, you know? Because um, they are innocent after all. They think that um, they were doing the best they can from their capabilities, from their ability to support you or to support us this far. Yet, at the same time, that support is sort of hurting them and hurting me, sort of thing. And so therefore, you know, that's there. And so in this case, it's not really saying, uh, pick a lane, you know, and choose. And uh, if there is anything about Buddha Dharma, it's that there is no choice. Yeah. That doesn't mean that there is a choice, but currently, that choice is unavailable. <laughs> uh, not in that sense. It's just that there is nothing to decide. But what is there is to observe. <clears throat> and so therefore, observe, observe, and observe some more. And so, samsara, samsara, it's nothing really to do with the enemies. It's nothing, it has nothing really to do with uh, strangers, it has a whole lot to do with our friends, you know, our dear, dear friends. Could be family, could be colleagues, could be all, all of those that we know. And more intimate a connection we have, the, you know, uh, the more, mm, more of that double edge. And so therefore, you cannot quit it, yet at the same time, you, you, you also cannot not quit sort of thing. So therefore, one may feel extremely stuck and uh, not know what to do, you know. So therefore, Chandideva or any previous masters or any, any Buddhas, what they're saying is, I never said anything about, you know, make, taking a decision. All I said was uh, the first noble truth, just observe, just watch. And so you watch, and you watch, and you watch. And that takes a lot of effort in, uh, in, 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 in most cases, because um, uh, um, how do you say, it could be one's own em emotional interpretation of one's friend, it could be also uh, due to circumstances, you know, uh, misunderstandings also. Either way, um, in short, uh, um, uh, there are those mixture of um, things, you know, that one sees or that one experiences. And so therefore, it takes time, it takes a bit of uh, diligence or effort to observe, you know. And by doing so, mm, I mean, particularly 
by using the Shantideva's method, then uh, it can become a great component uh, to developing bodhicitta. So in this case, not to say who's right, who's wrong, you know, not in that sense, of course. You know, uh, there's no room for choice, there's no choice and there's no judgment also. Mm, it just, mm, there's just that observation, um, like um, watching uh, a play, you know, watching a theater sort of thing. Where you just um, see yourself not completely in, you know, that intimate, but part of a character, and the so-called friends also sort of like a part of character. And then you watch this uh, or read this amazing script, and how uh, it, um, it has um, progressed or transformed from the moment of the first encounter to this moment, you know, in the form of uh, parents, children, uh, friends, um, and in a particular in, in a spiritual uh, uh, setting, then spiritual uh, friends, you know, can be teachers, can be students, can be uh, you know, spiritual peers, you know, everything. How uh, how it came into being, how it progressed, how it changed, how it transformed, yeah, observing all of that. And that takes a lot of effort, I think. Yeah. That takes a lot of diligence. But we don't have to call it diligence or effort, we just call it observation. Um, <coughs> and um, um, and it's, it is, uh, and then according to now, yes, according to the Shantideva's way, then uh, the um, fault of samsara, of course, which is um, the traditional term, or the nature of samsara, or nature of life, uh, through that observation, um, it's like um, visiting uh, a photo album or something like that in some ways. Um, photo album of oneself, photo album of others, where uh, you see if there is, you know, you can just imagine, of course, from a very adorable baby till, you know, <laughs> uh, as I said, um, the statues and the tankas, they are cute because they have, they consistently carry that baby face, you know, or baby proportion. Whereas we have right now small heads, big body. Not so cute anymore. <clears throat> uh, and so, how did it uh, transform from there to here? Very interesting observation, you know. And if you can cancel out um, um, certain things and just look at the progress what a marvelous, um, or what an interesting uh, observation that is, you know. Uh, let's say if we, we can cancel out everything and just uh, listen or view just the laughter from the moment uh, we were babies till now. Very, very interesting. Or cancel out the laughter and just focus on the tears or cries very, very interesting, or focus just on the anger, uh, <clears throat> like uh, we know how babies get angry, how ferocious they are, but at the same time, it means nothing, yes? <laughs> so from that uh, um, uh, perspective until now, how that anger transforms every time an a uh, anger is produced, very interesting sight. 
fast forward, rewind, fast forward, rewind, you know, and see. I mean, of course, I'm just uh, saying this for birth, aging, death, of course, illness included. Um, uh, very simple, you know. I mean, that's the traditional way of putting it, and it's forever classic. Bound by, uh, bound within those two, uh, those, those four aspects. And um, mm, uh, yeah, there's a. Mm, I only met once. Um, there's a great. Um, there was a great. Uh, I mean, that's the way we. Uh, say it. There was a great um, Theravada master called um, Dharmananda, Venerable Dharmananda. I met him only once. Uh, I don't know whether it was in Malaysia or Singapore, I don't know those days. Mm. And uh, he used to say the um, one way of defining human beings is uh, what comes out from here. You know, <laughs> meaning what comes through our lips. Whereas um, uh, animals and others, um, mm, it's a very different way of defining them. Maybe because of their feather, maybe because of their beaks, maybe because of uh, their um, habitat, I don't know. Humans, uh, what they do from this particular, or from his particular view, is talk, you know. We talk from the moment we are born until we are dead. We talk, 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 talk. <laughs> Constantly talking, talking, talking. Uh, if we have no room to talk out loud, we talk inside, you know. Talk, 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 talk. And, um, so much so that even when we are sleeping, we, we dream of us talking, talking, talking. <coughs> and so, yeah, that's very interesting, you know. Um, yeah. Within those four, birth, uh, aging, illness, death, what do we do? We talk and talk and talk. We cannot help it. <laughs> if we cannot talk verbally, we will type it, we will write it. You know, into thousands of books, or I don't know what. Uh, what do you call it? Post. You know, we post. <coughs> and so, um, yeah. Uh, Nothing really um, progressive or productive, I suppose, you know. And so, but I mean, okay, if it's just neutral, meaning it didn't uh, help us progress or go anywhere, but uh, at the same time, didn't do any harm, fine, you know. But in this case, um, I mean, uh, through our verbalization, we harm ourselves, we harm others. Um, and I mean, history is basically written and verbalized about that, yeah? I mean, uh, without verbalization then, or without uh, talking, there is probably, one could almost say that there is no history in, in a way. So ever since the human realm came into being to this date, we don't know for how long it has been, but it has been about, well, it has been a history of talks. And uh, through those talks, then it started, it waged wars, man-made famines, uh, all forms of disasters, everything, you know, quarrels, disputes, everything. So that's one way of looking at it also. You know. 
But of course, in this case, Shanti Deva, of course, is trying to refer to. I mean, um, I'm sure he, he meant uh, he, uh, those things, but more importantly, <coughs> without careful examination of our life or the nature of our life, then first of all, we cannot gain worldly, um, how to say, benefits, and then um, even beyond worldly benefits is also far, far away. And so therefore, uh, reaching individual liberation is far away and gaining uh, the perfect Buddhahood is very, very far away. And so therefore, if one wishes to um, practice uh, the ways of the Bodhisattvas, uh, according to this chapter, the diligence or joyful effort, yes, ob observation of um, uh, observation of oneself or our life or samsara is very, very essential. And so therefore we have to pay uh, a lot of care, a lot of um, affection, you know. Um, you know, um, we have to pay respect to, to view it. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that now suddenly let's just... Um, talk about the past, you know, suddenly out of nowhere, not in, not in that sense, but in a way that you compose yourself and you, and you already know how you want to look at life in general, and then particularly my own life, you know, in a more general way. So that then you begin to see lots of amazing things, you know, amazing confusion, amazing angers, amazing sadness, everything that to a point uh, mm, without having to be told to what to do from here on end, you know, that you yourself pretty much know um, what you want to do. It's like saying um, you have tasted through that observation alone you have a more uh, sort of um, clear palette. So then, <clears throat> so if these three components, I mean, if you are not, I mean, if you are close to uh, mm, uh, if we are in touch or if we are with these dear friends, dear old friends, uh, then it is for certain, you know, uh, that uh, laziness will grow, or pleasure or afflictive emotions will grow. And then from there, uh, their own words, then Shantideva goes on to use analogies to explain um, how, um, how to say, how dangerous they are, how lethal they are, and so on. And so therefore, so, then it says, um, snared by the trapper of defiled emotion, enmeshed and, yeah, and taken in the toils of birth, Again, you have stayed into the moth of death. What is it? Have you still not understood? Don't you see how, one by one, death has come for all your kind, and yet you slumber on so soundly, like a buffalo beside its butcher. All the paths of Flight are blocked, 
the Lord of Death now has you in his sights. How can you take such pleasure in your food? And how can you delight to rest and sleep? Death will swoop, uh, swoop on you so swiftly, gather merit till that moment comes. For even if you then throw off your indolence, what will you do when there is no more time? This I have not, uh, this I have not done, and this I am only starting, and this I am only halfway through. Then is the sudden coming, then the sudden coming of the Lord of Death, and oh, the thought, alas, I am finished. Then in Majid's number, the Jay Chip and the Lord of the One, Jehu John Jesus and Banjur. So, uh, focusing on the first two types of laziness uh, that of um, idle pleasure and uh, sleep. Um, already there, uh, you know, um, uh, fitting um, more towards the spiritual path or the Buddhist way. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like saying that on, on a worldly level, of course, uh, it is very clear, you know, in terms of uh, how these two types of laziness um, are lethal, but. In this case, in a spiritual format, how little they are. And so therefore, uh, you, you, whenever he says you, you, uh, it's not really saying uh, he's there and you are there and, you know, some form of accusation is there, but more in terms of you as in the so-called mind, you know, the so-called self. Or in this case, uh, the so-called uh, emotion. So he's meaning that. <coughs> and so therefore, um, how come that one can be at you know, such ease? I mean, it's the, the, the words are quite clear and self-explanatory. That how come that, so, uh, that we are still at ease? You know? uh, it's great that we have come, we have come this far um, to... Uh, I don't know, um, maybe we are practicing the precious um, ways of the Theravadas, maybe we are practicing the precious ways of the Bodhisattvas, maybe we are practicing the precious ways of uh, the Tantra or Mantrayana or Vajrayana, or whatever we call it, you know. Great. That's something to rejoice. Great. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we feel um, a lack of certainty, confusion, all sorts of things that uh, begins to sort of shake the foundation of our, um, how to say, uh, foundation of our inspiration, let's say. And at the same time, uh, we feel that we are constant. We are constantly falling into, you know, pitfalls, reaching plateaus, uh, all sorts of things, you know. And so, therefore, how come? And so, in this case, it's very clear uh, that um, uh, we have not observed well enough. That's the thing. Once again. It's great that we have come this far. This is something that where we have to, you know, pat ourselves. It, it's it's no uh, small. I mean, it's not just a coincidence, you know. It's not just a miracle. But um, let's say we have come up. We have read Mahamudra. We have meditated on Mahamudra, <laughs> and. Um, and uh, I had a near-death experience. And in that moment, in that one accident, I felt like I understood Mahamudra, you know. 
<laughs> and so therefore, I think I'm okay, you know. I think mm, just few uh, garlic uh, scraps are just holding me within this human confinement. But the moment uh, I die, I will go to pure land, you know. Uh, fine. You know, it's it's uh, already very great, you know. Already to have that kind of um, confidence is great, really. Yeah. I mean, it's been 40 plus years, close to maybe 50 years. And within that time frame, if uh, in your case, you know, in this case, because I'm born, you know, I was born in a place where Buddhism was uh, the so-called state religion, you know, and so therefore it's very normal. It's it's a part of breathing, it's almost. Whereas in your case, it's very foreign, yeah. And so for you to feel that way, it's already a great sign, you know. And it's something to, you know. But uh, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that that is it, you know. Especially if you feel similar emotions like others, similar conf uh, confusions as others, um, then is it a bad thing? It, does it mean that you have failed? No, no, obviously not. It just means you're a human, uh, first and foremost. And uh, secondly, it means kind of like hooray, you know. Uh, you can, uh, for, for the very fact that you're a human, then you can um, enjoy, the, enjoy these things, you know, in this case. You can be diligent, you have room for diligence, and particularly in these ways, in these bodhisattvas ways. And so therefore, um, yes. <coughs> so if you view it in that way, then these practices are not, uh, not to say, either repetitive or going backwards, you know. Because sometimes you could feel that way, it's very normal. And when one could feel that I have um, come to the highest teachings, and then at the same time, uh, why am I going through kindergarten? Almost, you know, that kind of feeling. It's not really kindergarten at all. There was no real kindergarten teaching at all by Buddha. Uh, the first noble truth was as hardcore as anything, you know. I mean, it's as advanced as anything, you know. Uh, yeah, it's both advanced because, like I said yesterday, it's because, uh, um, can you think of designing such a method where it will always be classic? Very difficult, you know, very, very difficult. It really requires immense experience uh, to be able to compose something like the Four Noble Truths, very, very difficult. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, no matter what era we are in, or um, I don't know, what society we'll be in, uh, in time, um, or what generation we'll be in, uh, the Four Noble Truths will be Four Noble Truths, and it will never age, it will never change, it will always be evergreen, really. Yeah. And so, from that sense, then there is no sense of going backwards, or feel that somehow I'm... Have I been, have I, have I been deceiving myself, or thinking that I have come so far, yet I feel like I'm um, uh, that much backward or something. Not at all. 
uh, all one has to do is um, uh, feel um, very encouraged that I have come this far. Your parents, your grandparents, and your ancestors never knew a thing about this Shantideva's literature or that of the Mahan Mudra or anything, you know. It is within your own generation that you have discovered these things and have built immense uh, confidence in them, you know. Wow. It took almost, uh, I mean, it took centuries for Tibetans to, <laughs> to, um, to develop that kind of confidence, you know, in the Dharma. So in that sense, amazing, you know. But, yeah, at the same time, now, uh, to make full use of that Dharma, then uh, these literatures are it. Yeah. <coughs> but worry not, um, I will be there to guide all of you. Uh, yeah, humor aside, um, Shanti Deva will be there all the way. Yeah. Um, and so I will be assisting Shanti Deva all the way. <laughs> <coughs> and so, yes. What have you discovered? Um, jelly leg. Uh, oh, Okay, um, so let's see. Yeah, the analogies are probably quite simple, I think. Um, And so, uh, therefore, now, if you have just one or two questions about the subject, we do before we begin the chant. Yes. Uh, the I will translate. Kamapa, you told that we should observe a lot our life and changes. Yes. But when the time comes that we need to start to play, in order to change the situation um, in our turn or to benefit others, How can we recognize this very moment when we should stop to observe and start to act? Act. Okay, I hope I understood the question. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So, <clears throat> uh, I suppose um, seizing the moment, recognizing the moment, what to do, what not to do, yes. I mean, this is coming from our, I, I don't know, one could say some sorry upbringing, or maybe due to our language, due to our grammar. Like I said earlier, there is no real choice, actually, you know. And this is one thing that we have to remember all the time. If we call ourselves Buddhists, I mean, I'm not saying we have to um, 
uh, dictate ourselves that this is it and we cannot um, play uh, and um, make fun of the idea of choice uh, or something like that, okay? No, no. We can play with that idea. It's very interesting. It's like saying, what if there was a choice? How would it be? You know, it's very interesting. But this, but the reality is that there is no such thing as a choice. You know, meaning something is predetermined. There's a, there's an absolute destination called Buddhahood. You know, enlightenment, pure land, as if they are uh, our final destination. You know, no, there's no such thing. Our body came together in the most strange ways, you know, in the most unique ways, uh, and um, it will disappear in the same way also, you know, either after a good laugh, you know, or excessive laugh, or after passing gas, I don't know. Um, or not being able to anything, anything is possible. And what, uh, what does that mean? Nothing, nothing at all, you know. Uh, so there is no real choice, yeah. Or mm, there is no choice, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, nothing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, there was a choice, but I'm sorry, it's not available at the moment, you know. It's not on the counter sort of thing, yeah. It's just that there, there just isn't. It's just made up, completely fabricated, the idea of choice. To do the right thing, to not to do the right thing, it's, there isn't, yeah. Should I put one more shake of salt or... No, you know, no. <laughs> um, if it tastes good, it tastes good. If it doesn't, it doesn't, you know. That's about it, yeah. And so therefore, um, observation means now. Yeah. And not, not later, be prepared. And then, <laughs> you know, no, not in that sense, yeah. It's just now already. Especially when you are healthy, especially when you have time, especially when you have all these ledgers, you know, yeah. it's now. Yeah. Because uh, it's easy to do it now and you'll get into a habit. You don't have to worry that because it's easy now, uh, it's like saying preparing for war, but when you're actually in the battle, will you really be prepared. No, it's not like that. Yeah. Because it's easy now, you can create a habit. You, know? you can create very strong habits. Habits are more strong than anything else. Yeah. And so therefore, uh, during this moment, if you can create enough habit, you know, like I said, uh, in, in a slope sort of thing, if you slowly, one by one, one by one, scrape, uh, a, you know, pave a channel, uh, water will flow that direction. It will not go anywhere else, actually. Same thing. So that's how the mind works, you know. And so, therefore, no need for decision. <clears throat> Your habit will take over. You step on a banana skin, you fall, you know, you don't have to think. Uh, mm, nanosecond, microsecond, not this, not that, oh, you know, no, nothing at all. Your body will take care and uh, make sure that you will land in the most harmless position. So it will just, the, the, the habit will take over. So, uh, dear Karmapa, my question is also related to observation. 
Uh, the Ganges Mahmudra with instructions from Telopa poems recites that when you look into space, uh, seeing stops. Likewise, when mind looks at mind, the flow of thinking stops and you come to the deepest awakening. So when we meditate, our purpose is to uh, become aware that everything is impermanent and ultimately everything is uh, space that playfully manifests all. Um, and a highly discussed and very controversial topic in nowadays society, also on a scientific level, uh, is um, the use of um, psychedelic substances like psychedelic mushrooms, ayahuasca experiences, LSD, and all of this. And some people do it in a less conscious way, uh, others use it as a tool in an effort to. Uh, I would say not to reach enlightenment, but to observe reality from like a different perspective, yeah. to uh, zoom out from material life and better understand some aspects of it, uh, get some insights and um, also to experience other states of consciousness, observe other ways in which a space can, uh, can, manif can manifest. Uh, and this can be alternatively or alongside meditation. So, um, through these experiences, people try to observe certain aspects of their life and maybe get closer to space. Um, and some, uh, some shamans and masters did and still do make some use of these drugs to reach other non-physical places, even uh, as a form of meditation sometimes. So I'm really curious, because it's such a highly discussed topic, um, to know what you think about the use of uh, these... Uh, substances to, yeah, for this specific purpose, like to sort of get out uh, of our physical comfort zone and uh, potentially uh, observe life from a different perspective. Is it safe to use them or not use them? Uh, no, like, uh, if, like th does it make sense if we use them as a tool, if they're used as a tool uh, to <laughs> maybe, I don't know, try to uh, better understand some, some aspects of, of reality, potentially, or experience other, um, other states of, of consciousness, yeah. different from like yes, the physical okay. one. <laughs> good, good, good. Um. I think uh, someone who's experienced <laughs> might be able to um, shed some knowledge on that aspect, but um, I don't think we have any experts here um, in this room. Um, but um, uh, The, um, from the when we let's, let's say when we are born and at the same time when we are dying let's say you know when we die yeah, when we die uh, and then when we are ill and when we are aging basically those four stages yes uh, they have no real assistance from anything else you know it just happens by itself. And that's a very interesting thing to focus on, I think. Yeah. Yes, uh, we can uh, enhance the experience, you know, through various means. Medication, intoxication. Uh, but, um, I mean, uh, intoxication or, you know, psychedelics, they go only so far. And then our body is, not to say designed, but it's in such a state that it can only cope with so much external help, you know, or support to um, enhance the experience, you know. <coughs> uh, and so therefore, um, there's not much, you know. And on top of it, on top of it, they become a source of addiction, of course, yes. Anyway, I don't know where I'm going now, right now. But what I'm trying to say is that um, 
to go back to what I said is that uh, those four stages are so passive, so natural, uh, that uh, we hardly notice it actually, you know. And it's not caused really by anything external. It just happens by itself, you know. We are aging as we speak by ourselves. Uh, we are falling ill as we speak uh, by ourselves. And we are going to the cemetery <laughs> by ourselves as we speak. So, um, for the s sake of observation, we really don't need any external help, I think, you know. I mean, we can experiment, you know, but that era is over, I think, yeah. <laughs> I think around the time when I was, I don't know, yay high, maybe that was the time, yeah. I think that time is over, yeah. sadly. <laughs> oh. I don't know, whichever way, yes. Now we are using a different type of, I don't know, psychedelics or I don't know, whatever, which is just uh, excessive talking and thinking, you know, yeah. And so, of course, that can enhance, like Shantideva used concepts, thoughts, chatters in the right way here, you know. And it has become very useful. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe one day we will get there. Well, not to say. Uh, how to say, like, um, we will get there. Uh, but till then, you know, we... Uh, we try to, I, I don't know, do our best to do what we can without too much external help, you know. Coffee, fine. Tea, okay, you know. I mean, uh, have you meditated under the influence of coffee, I mean caffeine? <laughs> maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I'm sure it's, it's, it's quite different, you know. Yeah. Um, but it only goes so far, and then you know, you know, like sugar rush. And so then it's not that, I don't know. Not it, it becomes boring very soon. I think. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean that you do the you know. You focus more on that grinding aspect, you know. Uh, that it doesn't mean that. It's just that uh, you can observe right now when your mind is clear, when you have time, when you have space, and by doing so, you will discover so many flavors. You will discover so many experiences like never before. Before, uh, when there was too much salt, you couldn't differentiate between spinach and broccoli. Now you can, you know. I mean. Have you ever eaten just uh, lightly sautéed or lightly uh, blanched uh, vegetables, you know, without any salt? Very interesting, you know. <laughs> it's new to me, yeah. Uh, and it has its own unique flavors that will blow your mind, you know, into thousands of pieces. And so, yeah. You can observe there. Yeah. Okay. Any more? Okay, but uh, you, you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? No. No, you also, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Hello? Hello. 
In the second verse of the chapter on diligence, yes, um, there is a term. I think in English it says self-contempt. Self. Self-contempt in Tibetan it should be like jidlu. Jidlu, yes. Yeah. Jelly leg. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Could you explain a little bit on the meaning and how to understand it? Um, you just have to watch, uh, rewatch the first few seconds of. Um, Mm, Avengers Endgame and, <laughs> <laughs> and Thanos will explain in a very clear way. Sorry, that doesn't ring a bell. Ah, okay. How did he say? Don't remember the lines right now, but um, yeah, jelly leg, you know. Or he says something like that turns your legs into into jelly or something. Now, in short, um, whenever uh, an, a good opportunity presents to do the right thing, <laughs> to do the right thing, suddenly uh, your uh, legs begin to w wobble. You know, <laughs> suddenly that I can do it. You know, it's not there anymore. You know? <laughs> Jelly leg, yeah. You know, and uh, like uh, I'm sure one has experience when we were smaller. Like, if you become very frightened or very scared or something, suddenly all the strength goes away. On a physical level, we feel like we cannot stand on our legs. We just fall on our knees because we are so frightened, sort of thing. Uh, it happens, you know. Yeah. It's not because we have um, we are fatigued or, or 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 anything like that. It just uh, happens because basic, basic, basically um, we don't see any I don't know purpose or reason to. To focus on on that, to focus on that object, to focus on that target, we are not interested, in short. And so, therefore, uh, the moment, uh, the, when the moment comes to do uh, to um, to do something, um, you just sort of basically back away. Yeah. So it's just an expression. Yeah. <coughs> Legs turning into jelly. Seriously, watch the first few seconds. You don't have to watch the whole movie, just the, <laughs> just the f first few minutes, and Thanos will explain very well. Yeah. Yes. No, but did I answer your question? Not really. You can uh, clarify if you like. Yeah, I, I think I get it, but the, the understanding that I got before is kind of like looking down on yourself, or that's what, how it has been explained to me, and then I thought like, um, why, why is that a form of laziness? Like being critical for yes. yourself, so that's, that's why I um, didn't understand it. Yes, um, looking down on yourself is... Um, it can be seen, I mean, I mean that's, that's the thing. Laziness is very, very in, actually very, it's very, if it was a person, it's a very intelligent one. That's why I said, let's say it's a friend, but it's a very intelligent friend, you know? And it has all of your record, you know, medical record, uh, psychological record, it has all of your records. And so therefore, uh, it can turn everything around, you know? Because normally, yes, one could think that I'm being humble, you know? I'm being, uh, maybe, um, not being too ambitious. I just, um, I really feel that uh, this is too advanced for me. Uh, someone with more experience, someone with more expertise would be able to do a far better job at it than myself. I'm just uh, a beginner. 
uh, and so therefore, no way. This is uh, this is something that I cannot do it now. You know, maybe later. So in this case, um, mm, the tradition or the um, sort of like a trend or uh, the um, uh, yeah, one could say tradition of the great uh, Milarepa was uh, always saying that never ever uh, feel that way, you know. Uh, there is a sentence uh, in Tibetan, Lama Vecha Yang Lovzang, meaning basically, <coughs> uh, in, in short, is saying something like uh, the, te- the teacher will surpass the, sorry, the student will surpass the teacher, you know. One has to have that kind of attitude. It's very important, he said. So it's basically explaining diligence. Because it's possible uh, that uh, we put ourselves a bit down, you know, uh, by using all the rightful logic, because laziness has all your record, you know, all your memory. And so therefore, then uses all of that and puts together in such a way that it's convincing, you know. Uh, and it's, it almost sounds like that particular voice at the back of my head, I think it's saying the right thing. And so therefore, um, that's it, you know. And then you lose the moment. Yeah. The moment's gone. Not that there is a choice, but the moment's gone. Yeah. When the moment's gone, it's gone. That's it, you know. Uh, and so therefore, um, instead, Melarepa's attitude uh, is that um, he had no, um, how to say, uh, blockage or hang-ups, you know. <coughs> when his students uh, like Rechungpa or Gampopa, when they, uh, uh, when he can see or when he sees that uh, that they they know more than him, maybe. Um, uh, in certain subjects, or maybe in certain uh, sets of samadhis or something, he's overjoyed, he's happy, you know. And so therefore he continuously encourages them by, by saying, yes, uh, that's how it should be, you know. It's not like the teacher is your standard, and then you can only come close to it, but that's about it, sort of thing, you know. So if, if one can surpass your parents or teacher, something great. And so in this case, uh, same thing. So ji luk means, so don't have jelly legs, you know, <laughs> when that moment comes, yeah. So meaning that, of course, it's a sort of a fine line. Uh, but, uh, but don't give in to laziness by thinking it's a fine line also, you know. It's just, <coughs> uh, you have to have that kind of um, inspiration that I can do it. I can do it, uh, and I can do it now, and not later. Then um, it goes a long way. Uh, it's always when we say later, later, then and the moment uh, slips, you know. Yeah. Okay, then now we f- uh, mm, focus on the meditation of Chenrezig. Uh, <coughs> and so, as I said yesterday, we don't have to focus on now thinking, yes. Uh, we can lo- let go of our uh, mm, curiosity, we can let go of uh, our doubts, everything. And so now we just focus on the meditation of Genesis. And all the visualization is there, as you know. But beside that, uh, what you're really focusing on uh, is um, the, what you call, uh, that loving aspect, caring aspect, um, mm, uh, as a sort of um, setup, you can tell yourself that I do it this uh, you know, the motivation is for all sentient beings, but beside that, you are just focusing 
on um, so something like one could say platonic type of, um, but not to say sterilized compassion, okay? Um, but um, one where it is in tune with understanding the nature of samsara, yeah. I mean, the observation aspect, basically. By knowing, well, however much you know, it's good enough now, you know. From there, you draw the inspiration, and then naturally you will feel something, like just as you don't want to get burned, you know, I mean, all those verses will come later, you know, just as you don't want to get burned or bitten, same goes for others, you know, and so like that, then just focus, you don't really have to tell yourself, I'm compassionate, I'm compassionate, I'm jealous, not in that sense, I mean, you can do it, but it's more about just taking this time to uh, focus on that uh, aspect of that quality, that it is there, you know. No matter how we look, no matter how, uh, who we are, where we come from, uh, it's somehow there. Maybe I'm not, uh, I don't really have that much of um, mm, respect for myself, let's say, for my health or for my uh, um, character or personality or anything, but strangely, I can still feel that, and therefore I'm not numb, so I can feel it. And so therefore you focus on that, you know, and visually to, 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 um, to help you see that, we do the visualization of Genesis. Oh, 
Oh. 